When you think of gaming, the kind you find in real life, what comes to mind? Roulette tables, windowless casinos, all-you-can-eat buffets? While you can certainly find that, WATG believes that gaming has, well, upped its game to elevate the customer experience into the world of entertainment. Five-star treatment where thinking is effortless from the moment you arrive is a given, and that includes getting to and from that perfect lucky parking spot. So how is the entertainment space pushing boundaries and creating spaces that go beyond expectations? What is the ultimate goal? What are the psychological and emotional components that need to be satisfied when creating a social space, and what materials or design elements are key to achieving that? Hello everyone, my name is Monita Rajpal. Welcome to The Drawing Board, a WATG podcast where we explore the ideas, issues, and trends that are being discussed within the design community today, as well as among clients and customers. Joining me today is Mark Yoshizaki. Mark is Senior Vice President at WATG. With close to two decades of experience, Mark has worked on numerous notable hospitality, leisure, and entertainment projects throughout the Middle East, the United States, and the Caribbean, a couple of which include the Mohegan Sun Phase 3 expansion, which is a 1,000-room hotel and casino expansion that includes retail, dining, and entertainment venues as well as the Tropicana Las Vegas Casino Hotel Resort, a 2,500-room resort hotel with a 750,000-square-foot podium containing a casino, retail, dining, and entertainment facilities. Mark joins me from the WATG office in Irvine, California. Mark, welcome. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Monita. The topic of this podcast is gaming. First of all, how would you define it from a design perspective? Based on the experiences I've had, which is, I wouldn't say is too deep, but definitely not shallow. The fascination of gaming is really the science of the actual user. I find that to be one of the more fascinating things, how people use the space, how they feel in the space, how committed they are to that, to gaming, and not necessarily to the point of addiction, <laughs> which is always the risk. But there is a science to how spaces are designed based on the user. And it's definitely evolved over the years. It's not just gaming for gambling sake, but it's definitely uh, more expanded to the, the level of entertainment. And that's been something that really helped to keep my interest in the gaming world. That's such an interesting point you make in terms of the science of our behavior. How has, in your perspective, how has human behavior changed over the years when it comes to how people actually utilize gaming and entertainment spaces? Most people are aware that the science of gaming in the past was get them lost in the casino floor, make them lose track of time, keep them there, run them through the gaming floor. If they have to go to the hotel, if they have to go to eat dinner, if they have to go to a show, but always have them run through the casino floor. That was the science. Uh, keep it dark, no natural light. All of these things, all of the things that I just said has evolved considerably over the years because it's more about the customer experience and is making that not so focused on just gaming and gambling itself, but the ability to entertain. And in entertainment, you need to give your clients what they want. And I think the developer, casino developers that I've been fortunate to work with, they're hyper-focused on knowing who their customer is. Mm -hmm. And it's actually very different between each of the developers, whether it be a higher price point, mid-market, low market, they all very focused on their customer, who they are, what they offer to their customer base and how to keep them entertained and happy. So it's, it's not one size fits all, which is, has been really interesting. And each location has a different purpose. Each casino in say Las Vegas, off the strip, in remote areas, Indian gaming, they all have a different DNA, mm. which makes it fun and challenging. Culturally, yeah. depending on where you are in the world. So, for example, an entertainment uh, gaming space in Macau, very different to what you would find in the United States and elsewhere. Absolutely. The level of competition between the developers and setting the right expectation is, is much higher, say, in Asia. Mm. The, the gaming customer, their target markets, the more wealthier clientele. 
in Asia compared to other parts of the world. So those are all of the significant challenges that designers such as us need to be aware of. The beauty of WATG with our 78 years of hospitality, we've been very fortunate. One, because we have an international experience. So we're already familiar with and comfortable working in different parts of the world. So we're very sensitive to the cultural aspects and bringing that unique factor into the designs that we do, not only to blend it with the gaming and understanding of the customer base, but the actual location. We've been brought to the table multiple times because of that hospitality spin, not to mention just gaming understanding at all its own. That's been something that really started to fit nicely into our wheelhouse because we're able to offer that international hospitality experience to the gaming customer. So you talk about the science, the psychology of human behavior, right? How do you then decipher and trickle that down into a design proposal? I guess the, the question is, how do you then translate the science into design? A lot of the projects that we start with, it's not that it's purposeful. It just is. The CEO, the COO of the gaming company tends to want to be a part of the initial workshops. And during those workshops, they talk about their customer base. They talk about TripAdvisor comments. They talk about all the social media comments. So they're very in tune with their, their market and their customer. So in these workshops, we tend to sit and we're obviously absorbing. We know the understanding of what makes gaming tick. We understand the complexity of large mega projects, but really the root of it and what gives you the true inspiration is what we hear from these CEOs that know their customer. They know the ceiling heights, they know the tightness of the space. They know what edges need to be amenitized and what doesn't. The circulation space around the gaming floor to make sure that families and children have a place to scoot around the gaming floor so they're not forced through it. Or the opposite, whether yeah. we want to push customers through it. There's adults only and there's also family entertainment um, type of gaming floors. So all of these nuances are things that we gather up in the initial stages of a workshop. And a lot of times it's by maybe the CMO, the chief marketing officer, the CEO himself, but it's always about their customer base. And that's the start of any design that we've experienced. We're not, again, we're not pushing everyone to gamble. We're pushing everyone to enjoy. And you'll see the more successful spaces accommodate that. They accommodate a variety of circulation that makes families and children comfortable. They can go to see a show without, maybe with a view of the casino, but not necessarily pushing them through the casino. There are local casinos that um, you can drive up, you can have a nice bite to eat, you can go to a, a nice sports bar, you can watch a, a fight or a game going on, and you can leave without being pushed into the gaming floor. So there's all these other factors that we're seeing that become more important than just the gambling aspect by themselves. What have been some projects that you've worked on that have really stayed with you, that you've learned from and that have inspired you? It may be cliche, but every project you, you learn something new. But one of the larger casinos, which was a fairly remote one, I won't, I won't be saying the name, but it was a remote casino that was, the strategy was to create a destination where gamers will typically come two to three days. Mm -hmm. Their goal was to extend that by one day, just one more day. So those little nuances, the little tweaks drove them to be concerned about parking, access, making sure that it's easy in, easy out, making sure that there's a gas station on their way home. All the subtleties that make it a pleasant experience and painless experience to make that one hour drive from the major cities that were nearby. And once you get there, there's a place to take care of your kids. There's a place to go watch a movie. There's reprieve, there's re rest and relaxation. So all of these extra amenities came into play that made the overall gaming experience much more comfortable and more comfortable for, say, couples, for families to a certain degree. But it had certain resort-like amenities that extended that stay. So in some ways, they're trying to figure out how to amenitize, how to make it a better experience. And obviously this was over 10 years ago. So fast forward to today, a lot of it you'll see in the market. So it did change the market because if you can keep a customer one or two days extra, that, that's 
major. What did you take away from that? <laughs> Honestly, it was how WHEG as a company fits right into that. <laughs> Because it's the extra amenities that we've been we've been working on and we've been delivering for decades. Mm. Our ability to understand the complexity of larger projects and focus on the guest experience was exactly in the sweet spot of hospitality. Whereas other architects are more object type buildings, there's signature architects that have a particular style. But we, for 78 years, have been always focused on the where we're working in, respecting the areas that we, we design in, and ultimately the customer experience locally and internationally. So it is about how the customer appreciates what is there, how they walk through it, how they experience it, how to make something super complex feel really easy for the user. How much does the the gaming environment done right have an influence on the culture of the moment, or is it more culture influencing gaming? The gaming business is a money-making business. There's no doubt about it. There's negative things that come along with it. There are people that object to it you know, significantly, very vocally. But I think the way we see it is that because of our hospitality experience, we bring a certain uh, care and consideration to that. And we can make that experience better. There are certain things that are out of our control. Addiction, certain negative things about it is out of our control. The, when we sit and we, we sit with the CEOs and the marketing managers that care about how to address some of the negative aspects of gaming, we get inspired by that. It's the um, comments such as, well, why would you put a restaurant near the gaming floor where there's children? You know, those kind of things. And at, through design, we can solve those issues, mitigate those issues. How do we make sure that there's a clear path of travel so that there's no conflicting views? Those are the things that we've always been challenged with so that you can have the ability to separate the, the amenities. From a design perspective, what do we have today that say we didn't have 20 years ago? As far as delivery of a project, mm. I, if we focus on that, obviously the complexity of a project, the size of the project, and some of the technology that we use allows for better coordination in our work. Data, the data grab, the way that people use data mm -hmm. to influence design it has been very significant in recent years. Mm -hmm. So technology, how we do our business, how we do our practice, that's always been evolving. Different programs, different softwares, whatnot. But the true game changer is obviously the social media because you get instantaneous feedback. And the expectation is instantaneous fix and, and response. The response time has been accelerated. Yeah. So the only way to get ahead of that is to understand the data better. The ways that they collect data, the ways they analyze it and implement it for quick changes uh, is probably one of the more significant differences that I've seen. And gaming companies and these larger entertainment districts, they do have the cash flow to make those changes quicker. Renovating a space, adjusting the casino floor, moving machines around, they're all based on data response. Do you How think that's here to stay? That? Do you think that kind of... Oh, absolutely. Quick, yeah? That's absolutely. Good. Everyone wants something fixed quickly. If they complain about it, if there's momentum in the complaint, the operator needs to service that and make it work. Competition is so high. And so the ones that are in tune with their customer base and, and get things fixed, get things modified, renovate a space, clear it out, change the color palette in response to comments and feedback, I think is, is here. It's there. How do you believe the pandemic, you know, the pandemic changed human behavior drastically for a good mm -hmm. chunk of time. Has that impacted, influenced design as well? Momentarily. So surprisingly, during the pandemic, gaming paused, but it didn't stop. The desire for that level of entertainment did not dissipate. It did not die. Granted, um, online gaming, certain digital things that kept people at home, those things uh, started to become more highlighted. In other words, the ones that had facilities, had brick and mortar buildings where people come and game, they realized that they can't ignore the online aspect of it. 
it had to complement their business. So the ones that responded very quickly during the pandemic could also supplement their revenue stream by embracing it. On top of that, online gaming is essentially virtual. It's everywhere. And there's no control over where the revenues end up. So the more that the brick and mortar companies have established, they have a gaming license for each state, wherever their jurisdiction is, to have an online aspect to that keeps the revenues, keeps the promises of, of revenue stream and taxation for the location that they're in, solidifies that. How do you yourself, as an architect, keep pushing yourself so that you are essentially offering something that perhaps you wouldn't have thought of before? I really do think that what makes the work that we do more unique and more enticing, favorable to a lot of clients is just the appropriateness and the way that we we create unique environments uh, from a design standpoint. General boxes, contemporary architecture that are fairly generic, that could be in Milwaukee or it could be in Kotai, those things typically get the job done, but they don't make for memorable experiences. Mm -hmm. So if, if you've seen our portfolio, we don't have a signature style. Um, we designed for the place, we designed for the purpose, we designed for the guest. And I think that's, our, that's what we bring to the table on every project. From a client standpoint, we have a great understanding of making complex buildings simple. And that's what it needs to happen. It's not only the guests. I mentioned the guest experience multiple times, many times. Behind the scenes, there's a service. There's a back of house. There's a full operations. And that, that level of operation could mean a 20-minute wait for room service or a 15-minute wait for room service. Mm. It could be the ability to get from one place to the other without significant signage because it's more intuitive. Those subtle design changes, especially operational, could mean tens of thousands of dollars, if not more, per month, per day, because of the ways that we figure, uh, break a building apart and put it back together again. Again, there's different focuses for different operators. Our reputation has always been really understanding the back of house and the serviceability. And that means dollars and cents to the bottom line. We've always brought that to hospitality world and we bring, we bring the, continue to bring that to the gaming world. You mentioned this earlier on, you know, in the past, there was the, the thinking that in order to keep someone in a gaming space, whether that's a casino or, or something similar, everything had to be designed to make sure that their focus was, was there, would stay there, whether it was the lighting, whether it was the lack of windows, whether it was the ventilation, everything about the design, the purpose of it was to make sure they stayed, right? And mm -hmm. keep spending money. How has that changed now? And what do you believe in terms of the, the nuts and bolts of it, whether it's comfort, materials, even if it is about windows that you can see the outside? I don't know. You tell me, how has that changed today? If I could go back to the first example, I think the way they made people stay was to confuse them, to make <laughs> yeah. them lost to lose track of time, all those basics, right? So that was not a pleasant thing. I mean, uh, it probably did the trick to keep them there a few hours longer, to make them gamble uh, around the clock. But from a real guest experience standpoint, it's not just keep them there, it's to keep them entertained. And that means attention to the, all the details. It's the materials that were chosen, it's to exceed expectations, it's to make sure that their the customer base sees things and experiences things that they wouldn't have in their own town and neighborhood. I go back to when I was, uh, this is maybe a, a kitschy story, but when I was younger, when you go to a hotel, you have things that you just don't have at home. As subtle as a, as a comfortable bed or, you know, a bathroom with marble, marble and beautiful fixtures all over. Those things are just experiences that you never had. Nowadays, everybody has it. They have it in their home. They have access at day to day. So what do we bring to the table to make those experiences higher than that. So mm -hmm. we're always striving to find how to put materials together in unique ways to keep the eye entertained and, and to keep customers entertained. So windows are allowed. Windows are now allowed. And in, <laughs> fact, in fact, there's 
there's outdoor gaming. There's different ways to game, obviously online and whatnot. So I think all bets are off these days. And casino developers are willing to explore and, yeah. and try different things. And when something works, they start to manage it, start to build off of it. And again, go back to, to database design, they get instant feedback and they can confidently make these changes yeah. to improve the guest experience and opportunities and amenities that they offer. So it's a generational thing, isn't it? It's a generational change. I I think so. And it's also access to information. It's just, yeah. it's obviously been there with, with internet and access, but the data feedback from the actual customers that they want and they, they're trying to keep happy. Mm. It is a service industry at the end of the day. You know, the si- a sign of a good design is that you may not be able to pinpoint specifics, but you do notice how you feel. What is the ultimate goal when you are designing a space? To exceed that. Whenever people have expectations is how do we elevate that? Where do we elevate that? And obviously we work within budgets and constraints so that we pick and choose at what moment, as soon as they walk in the door. It's actually prior to that. It's maybe where they park their car. It's making sure that there's generous space uh, so they don't feel there's no dangerous, right? So you have to design spaces so they feel comfortable, feel safe, and that the way that the operations blend in. So our understanding of how operators work is to ensure that there's complements with the design and the operations. So the physical behavior of the, the employees, how they valet the car, how they greet you at the door, those all get complemented with actual physical design that we can control. We can't control the operations, but we, if we understand it, we can design for it. And I think those, those subtleties actually help the customer feel better when they arrive. Working within budgets, we look at areas where it's the highest impact front doors, front entries. This may be a bit typical, but obviously we have to spend the money where it's most impactful. That's where we choose the better finishes and create the better experiences, the wow spaces. How do we move those spaces around to keep people moving through the spaces? What defines a wow space? How do you define that? From a design standpoint, we look for how the the transitions, we look for turning points, intuition, how do people feel comfortable that they don't feel lost. In larger spaces, larger gaming floors, there's nodes or wild spaces, if you want to call them that, to get people oriented so that they feel comfortable. So transitions from gaming floors to restaurants to retail to the different amenities, even to find the cage where they cash out. These things need to be intuitive. And we try to design where we believe you don't need signage. Signage will always be there, but how do we design spaces that are more intuitive? And these wild spaces help to orient, help to transition, help to create differences between environments, changing in lighting, low lighting, high lighting, different things that we play with to make people feel that wherever they're at, they feel oriented. You know, as you talk about this, you talk about all the specifics, whether it's back of house, whether it's about signage or the subtlety of the signage. I do wonder what, uh, completely understanding that everything that you do is a collaborative process both from the client's perspective and also from the team at WATG. So I I understand it as a collaborative process, but for you, what kind of a mindset do you need to get into or do you get into when you start and you're working on something and you start to think about all of these things? We started off as any project where there's a problem, a problem to solve. We think the big moves are the key moves everything else starts to fall in place. If you're working off of a formula and you're trying to design based on a book, a guidebook, somebody told you rules of thumb to design, it's going to look very formulaic. So the, the, the idea of having all of the right people in the room, and I'm talking about whether they're interior designers, the lead, lead architects, the F&B people, all of the main people that have an influence on that, Uh, we do like to have them in the room to have some influence about how things move. So once we get the big sweeping movements of how to organize the space, it will always be unique and it'll all be entertaining. And everyone has 
different priorities. Some people focus more on F and B. Some people focus more on the event centers or conference centers. So all of these connecting points and way we organize the space will drive the solution to how to address the customer satisfaction. May seem a little abstract in that no, way. No, I I think that's I, very specific actually in terms of how you go about your process. Because it is about the people. Yeah. So we need to understand how the operations work, how the operators' guests' uh, desires are uh, for for the market, and that we're not just designing objects; we're, we're designing spaces. So when we look at projects, it's it's really about listening in the beginning. That's the key. If we come in with a preconceived notion, I've always experienced this. You want to feel like you're ready to design, and so you have this idea that you want to get on the table. But a lot of times, if you really listen to your client, you have to adjust and you have to adapt. And if you don't, there's going to be constant conflict the entire way through yeah. the design phases. It's kind of like what I do. I have to listen. <laughs> you just have to listen. <laughs> you just have to. If I come in with a preconceived notion of what I want the conversation to to sound and be like, then it's just never going to be as fun. You have an idea, you have some guidelines, but you know it's always the guest that takes the lead. When we say you know the entertainment space, the entertainment space includes casinos and spaces like that. What else does that include? Food and beverage, a uh, highly competitive market. Um, so the food and beverage is, is very important, not only not only for the the gaming customers, but for the surrounding areas. Good food. I, I've noticed, you know, the idea of the three meal and the buffet line and yeah. the massive amounts of food. Um, yeah, there's a market for that. True, but there's also um, a more of a market for quality and unique dining experiences it the fmb and designing fmb spaces um, are also an art all its own so th- those make it for exciting spaces retail and retail experience there's a lot of debate on retail right because of the online aspect but it is something you still need to have i do believe the type of retail supports the brand that the developer is trying to convey so the way that the they choose their tenants has a direct connection to how they want to be perceived and who their customer is. Sometimes the retail is a good way to connect different components, to, to drive separation, mm-hmm. to create a differentiation, right? So if you have a more family-focused environment that you want to create, retail can be used as a separator and as a buffer to keep the circulation separate. That's really interesting. Access, yeah. Yeah. Then there's event centers, obviously for the larger shows, and there could be Smaller touring shows, they could be the uh, top tier, you know, class A acts. And then there's the Broadway aspect. So what they can offer to their customer base affects how these event centers are designed, whether they have a fly loft or no fly loft, an orchestra pit, the removable seatings, all of those subtleties, again, is gives them as operators the flexibility to attract the entertainment. Parking and parking garages, completely underestimated they're they're one of the most important things no way how come everyone has their favorite spot they want to park it's it's amazing they have valet areas some people don't want to be parking in garages they want to be parking in the surface lot the locals have their favorite areas everything is somewhat about luck right so they find a spot and then all of a sudden it becomes their lucky spot and it could be in a garage it could be in the open parking lot in the baking sun but once they believe it it's important to them. So the way I've never that people thought of come that in, before. <laughs> so distribution of garages, distribution of parking allows people to go and enter in easy access to their favorite part of the casino. They can go to their favorite restaurant. All of that push and moves yeah. people around the site for the larger project. And I think there is a um, there's a little bit of science to that. All right. There's a because com- comfort, social comfort, and the way people experience it doesn't start inside with the first, you know, at the, at the front door, it does start of how they're actually accessing and getting to the site. A lot of times when we look at projects and we're expanding gaming or we're expanding projects, first thing we talk about is the impact to traffic and how do we mitigate that and how do we improve that? So we look at it from a site planning standpoint in order to solve those other issues, because it is what makes people say, 
that was that was the most pleasant experience I ever had. Or that line to get to the garage was 30 minutes and I'm exhausted and maybe I don't want to come back next time. So we can solve those problems for our, our clients. Um, obviously, it becomes a much more successful environment, successful uh, destination. Absolutely. Before I let you go, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about your time prior to WATG. You worked with Walt Disney Imagineering, mm -hmm. um, and you worked on projects like Disneyland Tokyo, um, Disney Disneyland Seas. Paris, yeah. Disney Sea. How do you design the happiest place on earth? <laughs> how do you design the happiest place on earth? Right, Disneyland is the happiest place on earth. So how do you I, design it? You got to give credit to those that deserve it. It is the service. It's the it's the mental attitude. It's the mental training of the employees and this is i don't want to even take credit anything architectural it starts with that human interaction and how you feel welcome mm -hmm. right how, how you feel like they want you there and you make their day brighter the training of the staff is incredible mm -hmm. and it's not designing to happen it is it is <laughs> the happiest <laughs> place on earth because you feel like they want you there and they you know they're trained to do that. So I it goes back to what you were saying at the beginning, you know, it's, it come, if you start from a, uh, if you think about that, when you are designing the flow of the space has mm -hmm. a huge impact from the time someone comes in where they park and how they're treated when they park. And from then on, it, it, you know, the, the food and beverage services, the games, the rides, everything, it all yeah. works cohesively, right? I look at Disney as you park your car they tell you where to park, right? <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> they do. push you and they tell you where to park. <laughs> then you go to a tram and then you go on a tram with your, with your baby strollers and, and all the gear that you have to take with you. And then it takes you, it could take you 30 minutes to get to the front door sometimes. Right. And yet you still feel like it's the best place ever. Yeah. You stand in line for two hours <laughs> to go on a ride. So it's not always design, right? Because just the bulk and mass of people it is the people, it is the um, employees that make you feel like it's the best place to be. Yeah. So that's different. I think that is a little different from say designing architecture. And, and granted, they do care about that. They do care about how do you entertain someone for two hours when they're waiting for a ride? Mm -hmm. It's the pre-show, they call it the pre-show obviously, right? Yeah. So yeah. those things do matter, but really what tips it over to makes it bearable is the people that welcome you. And, you know, from a design perspective, too, and in terms of what you do at WATG and your, your, your teams at WATG, that it's always centered on the user, the guest, mm -hmm. the people, the staff that are going to be working at these yeah. uh, resorts, these uh, hotels, restaurants, gaming sites, entertainment spaces. It all comes down to the people involved, right? It is. It is. It, something can look amazing, but if the people aren't happy... And comfortable yes. there, it's going to be felt and it's not going to be worth a dime. Talking about memorable experiences, I had, um, I've, I went to Zurich and went on a back of house tour with a, a particular operator. And the whole purpose of that tour was to talk about employee happiness. How they treat their own employees reflects on how the employees treat their customers. So it's a trickle down, right? Yeah. So the importance of that training and then their effort to keep the employees happy with their how they serve them food how they take care of them with rest areas their locker facilities hyper focused on employee retention so end of the day what they're trying to tell us as designers is we need just as much attention in the back of house as we do in the front of house yeah and we get that but they elevated that thought process and that was extremely memorable experience because it brought light to making sure that the employees were happy the dining experience that even had exterior exposure so they had natural light coming into their dining hall all of those things there so it went farther than just their guests it went to their employees, which was really refreshing. And mm. you feel like when you're designing for people like that, you feel like you're improving um, so much more than Absolutely. just building buildings. You're improving quality of life as well. Mark, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. Thank you so much for this. I know. Thank you. Appreciated the time. 
That was Mark Yoshizaki, WATG's Senior Vice President, joining me from Irvine, California. You've been listening to The Drawing Board, a WATG podcast. I'm Monita Rajpal. Thank you for being with us.